Okay, this is our first color lecture. We have a couple of them. Um, so today we're going to talk about color physics. So like all of our lectures in this class so far, um, we have some slides that look like this that have bolded phrases or words that have definitions next to them. And as you know by this point, those are your vocabulary words. So you want to pay attention to those. I hope you've all listened to the Radio Lab podcast episode about color and posted your reflections on the discussion board in the forum already. Pretty rad, right? I love Radio Lab. I think that's a super cool episode. Um, okay, so now that we have that kind of framework, let's delve a little deeper into color physics and figure out how all of those things work that are discussed in that podcast episode. So, uh, as you know, um, we, we know a lot of, of the things that we know about color because of our friend Sir Isaac Newton. Um, but before we talk about Newton, let's talk about color in a little bit more of a basic accessible kind of level. So first of all, when we think about color, color immediately attracts our attention. So when, like for example, if you're in, um, I don't know, a Walmart or a Toys R Us or something, and you go to the aisle that's toys for little, little kids, for like toddlers and infants, what do you notice about them consistently? They're all really bright colors, right? And that's not an accident. The reason that they're all really bright colors is because infants and toddlers, humans at a young age, respond more directly and more actively to color than to any other stimuli. Um, so they've done lots of different experiments about this and about how perception develops and works in kids. Uh, my cousin is actually a cognitive psychologist who studies um, this in infants and, and their perception. And so when presented with an array of different bottles, for example, that are in all different shapes and all different sizes and have different colors of liquid in them, little kids, little toddlers, will group and organize those various array of bottles in various sizes and various shapes. They organize them by the color of the liquid, not by the size or the shape. Because color holds kind of a primary responsive role in our brains. So it's very important to how we tend to see the world. Um, color also has great emotional impact. Uh, and we as artists and designers have to be aware of that, right? When we're when we're creating work, when we're um, creating marketing, when we're doing different things, we have to know how color gets people's attention and how it impacts them on different levels. Um, so when choosing a palette for a project, there's a lot of different things to keep in mind. Color also has different connotations um, in different cultures. So that's another thing that we'll delve into a little later in one of the later lectures. Um, but basically, let's talk today about color physics. To use color fully, we have to understand the major types of color, how they are created, and how they interact with each other. Color theory is the art and science of color and its interaction and its effects. As artists and designers, we combine aspects of color study from chemical, physiological, and psychological perspectives um, as well as, as visual and, and physical attributes of color. So we have to be kind of aware of a whole spectrum of influences and of um, contributing factors to color and to its perception. So for example, like physicists, we use color wavelengths to create visual effects. And we'll talk about color wavelengths a lot today. Uh, like chemists, we must be aware of the safety and the permanence of dyes and different pigments. So we don't want to use like a lead-based dye or pigment in one of those toddler toys because that's poisonous, right? So we have that kind of in common with chemists. Um, like physiologists, we uh, put into practice different theories about how color is perceived. Like psychologists, we utilize color um, in communication and how to express different emotions or, or cause viewers of our work to experience different kinds of emotions. So there's a lot of different aspects to color and color physics that we need to consider as we're making art. Okay, so additive and subtractive colors are the two main color systems. Beams of light create additive color. RGB, you might be familiar with this. 
So RGB on a computer screen, that's the, the color system of, a, of computers, refers to the primary additive colors, and those are red, green, and blue. So additive colors deal with light, colors of light and when you're mixing light. On the flip side, what we more think about um, in this class, because we're not doing digital work, are subtractive colors. So subtractive color is created when white light is reflected off of a pigmented or dyed surface. This is the kind of color that we work with when we mix paint, for example. This is um, what we generally, as a general population and as artists, think of when we hear color wheel primary colors, we generally sort of defer to subtractive color. Now, if you work in animation, you work in different kinds of illustration and design, you're going to have to know both. You need to, or, or theater lighting, for example, or film lighting, then you need to also be familiar with the added color mix, mixing. For this class, you mostly are going to be working with subtractive color. And the primary colors for subtractive color are red, blue, and yellow. Okay? Okay. So, um, the other category of colors that I do want to touch on, because a lot of you go into illustration or marketing or print, uh, printing and production, um, is uh, process colors. So process colors are used in mass production and printing. Process color primaries are also called transparent primaries. And uh, those are cyan blue, magenta red, and yellow. So that's like what your printer cartridge is, your, the, the ink for your printer, they're labeled with cyan, magenta, and yellow, right? So C-M-Y-K, that's cyan, magenta, yellow, K stands for black. So if you're working in that kind of production, those are the sort of colors that you need to be aware of, which is like process colors. Okay, so let's see process colors so okay so let's get back to our friend Isaac Newton so if you listen to the radio lab episode about color they start off by talking about Newton and as you may recall um, Newton was so interested in figuring out color and light and their relationship that he stuck a blade in his eyeball so thanks Newton for doing that so we don't have to <laughs> okay um, so Basically, the basis of color theory is about the physics of color and light. All of our perceptions and systems of color exist because of the connections between color and light. And this was discovered, again, by our friend Isaac Newton. Um, as he discovered, white light, when it passes through a prism, so like a crystal, a glass prism, um, when a single beam of white sunlight passes through a prism, it splits. Okay, we call that refracting. So it's refracted or bent and separated into different colors. Okay, so this creates the spectrum of hues, like what you see in this illustration. And the white light separates into these colored light components, uh, as you heard about on Radio Lab. Um, when white light hits a surface, some wavelengths are absorbed and others are reflected, okay? So the reflective wavelength is the color that we see. So a white surface is something that reflects all of the color wavelengths, so they all bounce back, so we're just left with white. Um, and a black surface is something that absorbs all of the wavelengths, right? So they're all absorbed in, they mix together, so that's how we see black. Color reflection and absorption are rarely total, so that's why we see different hints of other colors, okay? Um, but for example, like you perceive a stop sign as red. The reason is because that surface is reflecting red back to your eye and absorbing all the other colors, okay? Red has the longest wavelength, violet has the shortest wavelength of the colors that we perceive. Okay, um, here's another one of our vocab slides, right, that has a lot of different fun terms for you to get familiar with. So now we're going to talk about color interaction. And color interaction refers to the way colors influence one another and also our perception. 
um, we almost never see colors in isolation. Simultaneous contrast refers to the apparent change in color when it is paired with another color. You have a visual vocabulary study about this, visual vocabulary number nine. So when you look at this, it appears that the middle squares are different colors, are different hues. They're not. They're exactly the same color, exactly the same hue, but we perceive them differently because of the color that is surrounding them. So color interaction then becomes especially dramatic when we use complementary colors, which we will talk about in the next lecture, but complementary colors are blue and orange, red and green, violet and yellow, okay? Um, so if you stare at this, if you stare at this distorted view of the American flag, and then look at a white surface to the side, you will see, you have to stare at this for like 30 seconds, then look to the side, you will see um, a image of the American flag in its traditional colors. This effect is because of what we call opponent theory, okay? So opponent theory posits that the cones in our eyes, so in your eyes, you have different kinds of perceptors called cones and rods. The rods are to do with depth and value, the cones are to do with color. So a good way to remember that is cone and color both start CO, okay? So opponent theory um, posits that the cones, the color receptors um, in our eyes can only perceive one complementary color at a time. So this is similar to a visual phenomenon that we call after image, which this image is what an after image of the American flag looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, if we stare at a red square for 20 seconds and then stare to the side on a white surface, you'll see a shape that looks like a square that's in either green or a greenish blue. And the reason that that happens is because of cone fatigue. So the cone, the color sen sensor in your eye, gets overburdened by looking at the same color for too long, by looking at red for too long, and then it switches to a different cone, a different uh, receptor and to kind of give it a rest and so then it starts perceiving green or greenish blue. Okay, so that is after image and opponent theory. Let's talk about the color wheel. So this relates to your visual vocabulary studies number seven and eight and we're just going to define a bunch of different related terms and get kind of comfortable and used to the color wheel and how uh, it works and how the colors on it interact and how we use them. So the hue is the name of a color and the hue is determined by the color's wavelength. Physicists, painters, and philosophers have come up with and devised lots of different systems to organize hues. There's lots of different models, there's lots of different ways to do it. Uh, Johann Itten, came up with the color wheel. This is a version, a simplified version of his color wheel. Um, and it's a pretty common method and it's what we're going to utilize in this class. It's pretty traditional to use the color wheel and it makes a lot of sense. So for visual vocabulary number seven, you will create a color wheel and you need to label it. Okay, let's talk about the color wheels parts. So on a color wheel, we have three, like on a basic color wheel, we have three different categories of color. We have primary colors, we have secondary colors, and we have tertiary colors. Um, now, we're talking about subtractive color, all right? We're talking about pigment, not about light, right? So primary colors in what we are talking about are yellow, red, and blue. To get secondary colors, primary colors exist and you cannot mix any other colors to make them. So yellow, blue, and red cannot be made from mixing any other colors. That's why they're primary. So we start with our primary colors and from there we can make our secondary colors, which are orange, violet, and green, by mixing yellow and red to get orange, yellow and blue to get green, um, and red and blue to get violet, okay? So those are the secondary colors. Then we have the tertiary colors. Tertiary colors are when we mix a primary with a secondary. So that's yellow orange, red orange, red violet, blue violet, blue green, and yellow green. So on your color wheel, which you are going to make for visual vocabulary uh, study number seven, you will need to have on your color wheel 
your primary colors, your secondary colors, and your tertiary colors, and I want you to label them like you see here. So you'll, you'll make your color wheel and then you'll say the name of the color. So for example, yellow primary, yellow orange tertiary, orange secondary, so that you have all that information readily available. Okay? All right. Um, let's see. More color definitions, more vocabulary words, hooray, everybody's favorite things. Remember that these slides exist on Blackboard so you can come back and study these and look at them uh, at your own pace later. So the next thing we're going to talk about is color temperature. This is also something that relates to our color wheel because if you notice in my example here, this is how colors are organized on the color wheel, but you can break them down into cool colors and warm colors. On your color wheel that you're going to make for visual vocabulary uh, study number seven, I want you to also put a little indicator of where the cool colors are and where the warm colors are, okay? Color temperature is an important aspect of hue, and temperature in this case refers to not just the way we perceive things as looking warm or looking cool, it also uh, physically relates to the color. So if it snows outside and you take a bunch of squares with different colors on them and you lay them on top of the snow, the ones that are warm colors, the snow underneath there will actually melt faster than the ones that are cool colors. Why does this happen? Well, if you think back to all the things we've been talking about, we were talking about wavelengths of light which relates to how we perceive color. Longer wavelengths melt the snow faster. So the warm colors literally are warmer than the cool colors, okay? Fun fact for you. The next thing we're gonna talk about is value. Now, we already had a separate lecture all about value. Your last assignment was about value. You've done visual vocabulary studies related to value. So you might feel like you're a little valued out. Well, Sorry, value also pertains to color. So as we know, value is the lightness or darkness of something. And in color, that's still relevant. It's not just black and white, like working with graphite or working with charcoal where we have to think about value. We also have to think about the lightness and darkness and how we impact or change the lightness and darkness of colors when we're working with color. Okay, so Color value works like this, and we get some more vocabulary words. Tint is when you take a hue, a color, a pure color, which is sometimes called hue and sometimes called, as you can see on this uh, diagram, chroma. So you take hue, you mix it with white, you get tint. So that is your lighter value um, of color. You take hue, you mix gray, or you mix what you've previously mixed black and white to make gray. So pure hue plus gray equals tone. So that's like your middle values. And then you take your hue and you add black and that creates shade. So your shade is your darker value of a color. So each color on your color wheel also has its own value scale and its own spectrum of value, okay? So, these can also be represented in a color wheel. I'm not having you do this um, exactly, but uh, basically you can represent all of these different variations in our color, our color wheel form if you want to for future reference. So you can represent it in this way where you have the pure hue as the outer ring, then you have the tint, then the tone, then the shade. Okay. The last thing we're going to talk about in this lecture is intensity of color. So intensity has some related terms that are sometimes used interchangeably with it when we're talking about color, and those are saturation and chroma. So intensity, saturation, or chroma are all related terms that refer to the purity of a color. So like it appears on the color wheel, that is its most pure form. Uh, artists and designers use high intensity colors to maximize impact and grab our attention. So things that are high intensity are also called bright, okay? Um, you can dull a color's intensity by either adding some of its complement or adding gray. So at the top here we have yellow plus gray equals less intense, right? And in this lower graph, 
you have complementary colors together. So we have blue and orange. If you want to make your orange less intense, add some blue, add a little bit of blue and you'll get a more uh, dulled sort of grayish toned version of orange. Same thing with yellow and violet, same thing with red and green. So we'll talk more about colors, color schemes and palettes and how uh, they work together in the next color lecture. But for now, that is your lecture on color physics. See you next time. Oh, I have another slide on saturation and hue. This is saying all the things I just said with different illustrations. So here you go. So <laughs> saturation, hue, and value represented here in some different illustrations.